to Third Phase of Moon. My name is Blake Cousins, and in this episode, we're going to go over, by popular demand, the Alien Human Project Part 2. Dr. Roger Lear and his claims of removing alien implants is in a doubt. It is scientific fact. Now for this exclusive Part 2, the Alien Human Project. Let's get to it. World renowned Dr. Lear, when we made Alien Human Project Part 1, it had a global impact. We've had people that came out that never wanted to talk about their experiences, and now because of the courage that you've put yourself out to get those implants, they now have come forward. What inspired you to, to continue to do this in the face of all these ridicule? Well, you mean, of course, the fine line that I walk. Yes. <laughs> the line of uh, academia, medicine, and research into uh, a tremendously unknown subject. And I say unknown subject, although it's been in existence for thousands of years, because there really isn't that much physical evidence of, you know, things that happen uh, within the field of ufology. Uh, you know, we've seen things flying in their skies. We've we've looked at uh, at uh, drawings and cave paintings and wood carvings that have been in existence for thousands of years. But you know, people have been looking for the so-called smoking gun, uh, and that's what we seem to have found. Maybe on purpose, and maybe by accident. I'm not convinced to this day. Why is it that I'm the only one? it seems to be on this entire planet that seems to be removing objects from individuals and then subject them to severe academic analysis and come up with things that are not from this world. You just got to my next point exactly. When you look at a photograph now, 50 years ago a photograph would have been proof, but now with Photoshop it could be doctored. What you've been removing is the smoking gun and a lot of critics especially the skeptics always have an explanation for it let's go deeper into why we can prove this is the smoking gun and how you would want to invite the academics to look at the lab reports that you've gotten well as to whether uh, i consider myself uh, an academic science i don't i'm more like the uh, the plumber or the purveyor of the merchandise I get it out of the human body, the individual that has it, and then I present it to science, you know, as an ordinary individual. I'm sure they have some respect because of my medical background, but it's the word that comes from them after analysis that they are telling me that these objects contain things like non-terrestrial isotopic ratios that they contain carbon nanotube structures, which are very complex. And uh, we're looking at a technology which eight, maybe nine years ago, uh, there were scientists, noted academic scientists that said they couldn't exist. And now there are companies who are actually using them, making them. Japan is trying to make them into a cloth so that they can make clothing out of them. They're talking about a space tower because they are the strongest substance known to man. And if you build a space tower that goes up a mile or two above the earth and then launch a vehicle from there, you've saved a tremendous amount of money and fuel because you don't have to defeat the amount of gravity that you do from an earth launch. So we look, we find carbon nanotechnology and we find things that we don't understand. We find uh, gold spheres, for example, that uh, we don't understand what they do. We find apertures in the metal which are only as wide as one atom. Now that's pretty small. And we haven't been able to yet look down into that aperture and see what's down in there. But uh, one day we will do that. We know that they, they emit radio waves. We know that they have electromagnetic fields and an electromagnetic residue, which lasts for about uh, 30 to 60 days following the removal. So these are all scientific facts. These are facts that 
in written reports I get from academia, and I mean top academia, because we have, you know, three of the world's finest nuclear physicists uh, on our science board for ANS research. And that's not including the myriad of other well-respected laboratories, like Los Alamos National Labs, Southwest Labs, uh, and I could go on and on and on with a list of laboratories. You know, one thing I love is what separates you from all the other researchers is you are a doctor and a scientist that works with data. Like you said, you don't, you're just a plumber. You pull these out and it's the lab reports that are telling you what this is. So everybody out there who's listening and watching this documentary, request the lab reports. They are available to be read. As a matter of fact, aren't they on your website? Yes, there's a number of different laboratories. Uh, the reports are listed on the website. And uh, we, we also have to take in consideration that the initial uh, scientific results came from the National Institute for Discovery Science, which was Bob Bigelow. And he is the one that paid for and got the reports and material from, uh, from Los Alamos National Labs and New Mexico Tech. So I had nothing to do with it at all just presenting him with the specimens and having him send them to the laboratory. And when they came back originally, there was a, a giant a booklet of data. However, there was no report. And that irritated Mr. Bigelow to the point where he called the lab up and he said, look, I'm paying for this. I want a report. And that's when the first report came in and the scientists that looked at it said these were closest to meteorite samples. Now that was a shock. You, you just mentioned Arthur or Bob Bigelow, who was well known for the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, his name has been thrown around ufology for the last couple of years. He's somewhat, somewhat been in the limelight. Do you think with his Skinwalker Ranch, the laboratory results that he got from funding your research, was, did he possibly make anything from uh, what he learned? And, and monetary gain? Absolutely no. He put out all of his money, never asked me for to spend uh, a penny. And now he, of course, has a company called Bigelow Aerospace. And with uh, the consent of the government, he's in a position where he can actually regulate some things because of the nature of the space business. You wouldn't doc or Mr. Bigelow became involved. Do you he's linked with SpaceX, which is making enormous leaps. They just tested a new rocket which is called the Grasshopper, a reusable rocket that's not gonna re burn or burn up in the atmosphere. Do you think with the lab reports that I was saying, uh, do you think he used any of the findings to apply them to his technologies in SpaceX or any anything else that he's doing? That I can't answer. I, I don't know because I'm, I'm not uh, knowledgeable of what it takes to put a vehicle into space. Now the next thing is that I know that he took designs <laughs> that he purchased from NASA. Uh, for example, the expandable module. That didn't have uh, you know anything to do with what uh, the findings that I was uh, finding with the implant subject, but yet it took a technology that he developed and he put up you know uh, the Genesis space module Genesis one and Genesis two, and uh, then looked at all the data coming in and they are much much safer space vehicles than the International Space Station. Let's go back and talk about the, tech, the actual technology. One thing I love is it has we our technology as a human race grows. We're able to dive in these things deeper. One thing you mentioned was single-sized atom particles. What on earth can be made that, into a size of one atom? Virtually nothing that a human being can do, right? Well, now we can use single size atom in what we call nanotechnology. That is nanotechnology. If you take a single carbon atom and you string two of them together and then three and then four and put them in a circle, 
Then you have a, a circle of uh, uh, carbon nano atoms, and if you extend this into a tube, you have a CNT or a carbon nano tube. Now, if you extend that out, then you have something that's similar to wiring without insulation. So let's say you take uh, one of these carbon nano strands and you wrap two of them together and then you can actually make a cable and you get a carbon nano bundle. But this is uh, sub microscopic. You have to look at this on the level of an electron microscope. So we, we have it. We are using it. And this is the, from what I understand from reliable sources, is the basis for communication in the future. Uh, just as uh, Star Trek uh, talked about, you know, going to subspace frequency. Well, how do you communicate if you're in deep space? Are you going to wait the length of time that it takes us to get a signal from Mars back to Earth? No. So you go into another technology, which is scalar wave technology, faster than the speed of light. And uh, some laboratories, very few, I won't mention who they are, but they are uh, conducting experiments with scalar waves. And they told me that this is the communication of the future, both in, in television and, and radio uh, communication. Carbon nanotubes, or the nanotechnology that we humans are using now was not available when you first removed the first implant, correct? That is absolutely correct. Carbon nanotubes were an argument. It was only existent in the minds of certain scientists that said, perhaps carbon nanotubes exist, exist in nature, but we can't find them. Perhaps they could exist if you could make them. But then the other half said, no, it's impossible. You can't make them. And now to see what you know that technology was then and what the technology is today, because a carbon, a carbon nanotube today can be single walled, double walled, triple walled, and you still have that, that aperture in the center, like the center of a hose. And you can put other material in that center. And that's called a doped carbon nanotube. So let's say you make a very small one, very small doped carbon nanotube. Let's say that the, the substance in the middle of it is a very potent antibiotic. You can give that person an injection of that antibiotic in this carbon nanotube and have the carbon nanotube go directly to the area of the infection, a tumor or, or something else, or a drug to, create, uh, to, uh, to treat cancer for example. So the, the implications of carbon nanotube technology alone are, uh, pardon the pun, out of this world. You mentioned that there were scientists debating on both sides, yet you had something in your possession that was artificially made that contained those. Now, do you think, fast forward to when humans started using things on the nanotechnology level. Do you think that it's possible the government may have seen your uh, your lab reports and may have used certain labs, you've used that to actually get to us humans using this nanotechnology? Well, the possibility of uh, government uh, looking at my work and uh, copying it, so to speak, or using the things that uh, our scientists have uh, uh, illuminated. Uh, I doubt whether that's true because uh, a lot of this may have gone back to Roswell back engineering. We're talking about almost 60 some odd years. They've had uh, a 60 some odd years, let's say, jump on anything that I ever did. So I'm sure that within the black budget projects, they already know all the stuff that we're learning and trying to present to the public and to, and to industry. Because some say that black budget technology in compared to academic science is 100 years ahead. But again, when we're talking about carbon nanotubes, you also mentioned something about gold sphere. Can you expand on that a little bit? These small gold spheres that we find, uh, but we don't know what they do. 
Uh, we also find what are called orthorhombic crystals. And these are crystals composed of sodium chloride. Now, sodium chloride is just ordinary table salt. But the crystals of the salt are random. There's no particular shape. These are a particular rectangular shape and in varying sizes. So they're called orthorhombic sodium chloride crystals. Now, if we think back to the early days of radio, and what did we have? We had a crystal set, you know, and a copper wire, and an earphone, and a battery, and we were able to get a miraculous radio station through a crystal. Well, crystallography or crystallography, the study of crystals today, still can't explain what happens uh, with the atomic structure inside a crystal that will allow a frequency to be carried and then received. And yet we've as been far using, as we know, and we've been using that, and we've been using that constantly. Uh, until we went to a different uh, technology, which was the you know, vacuum tube and then transistor technology. But in all the radios, it, all during World War II, all the aircraft radios, when you switched from one station to the other, all uh, a lever was doing was going from one crystal to another crystal to another crystal. They were all multiplex crystal sets. Again, more proof that using something without possibly knowing it and what can that lead to. Now, I want to focus more on why this is the smoking gun because we know it's the smoking gun, yet those people out there watching this, some of the people who left on the comments, and this first one was released to great fanfare. And there was a lot of people that said for us, and wow, this really is happening and it's there. But there still is others who are on the fence. Let's dive deeper into proving to them. We got the lab reports. We see the carbon nanotubes, we see the gold spheres. Let's talk about the radio waves and the, the electromagnetism results and what else you can tell everybody. Okay, first of all, there's a certain percentage of these that we've removed, that uh, about 70% that uh, emit a radio wave in the FM band. And when we looked at a classified uh, chart of where these frequencies occur, both in the kilohertz and megahertz range, we, we know that they are deep space fixed or mobile deep space frequencies. Now, is it, oh, the question is, are we really detecting deep space frequencies or are we merely detecting a harmonic of some other transmission of another kind of a wave as that I mentioned before, a scalar wave technology that enters our electromagnetic spectrum and we get what's called a harmonic. And that harmonic in our spectrum are these radio waves that we receive. Now, the other possibility, of course, which in today's world you can't deny, uh, is the possibility that a deal has been made between somebody from out there and somebody from here so that they can gain the same data that somebody from out there is listening to. And I believe this is, this is biological data and it's data having to do with the progression of our DNA. Because if we look at abduction cases all over the world, we see that there's the taking of sperm and ova. That means a genetic experiment is being carried out on human beings on the face of this planet. And if that's true, then maybe they want to find out, just like we do using human logic, how long a bear sleeps or hibernates during the winter, uh, what the metabolism of the body. For example, John Glenn, when he went into space, he complained on national TV of having to swallow implants because it was necessary for mission control to know his body functions and the only way that they could get it in was to have him swallow them. So he, he did, he, he swallowed them and they got the information. But you know, to, to make a comparison, suppose somebody else wanted to know the information that NASA was getting. They would, you know, tune in on it and they would be able to get it too. 
because they're not operating in a scalar way or unknown technology. So those are the two possibilities. One is that they are true radio frequencies that we're getting or that they are harmonic of something like a scalar wave which travels through space faster than the speed of light. Since the last film, Alien Human Project 1, there have been significant changes such as the citizen hearing. Can you tell everybody in the world who's watching this what changes you've had, including your testimony there, what else you've done, what else your research has unlocked? Well, in case uh, the uh, viewer of this program doesn't know what the citizen's hearing is, it was a hearing that was conducted in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. And it was set up to mimic the way a hearing would be conducted in Congress. And we had uh, retired uh, uh, congressional members <laughs> that uh, composed a committee that would conduct a hearing just as if it was in Congress. And we also know now that while the congressional hearing was going on, President Obama was in residence down the street. And we also have information leading to believe that he knew exactly what was going on with the conference that we were having. So uh, since that time, you know, an effort is being made, including me as uh, one of the witnesses that testified uh, to try and get that information because it's a worldwide event. It's not a United States event. It affects the entire planet. And so we want to get this information out to the public. So I'm working with uh, Steve Bassett and the Paradigm Group on several different projects. Each one works in conjunction with the other. The first thing is to get uh, the 35 hours of testimony in a DVD set out to the public, out to, out to the public in general. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to send each single member of Congress, their assistants and the White House staff and the president, a full set of copies of this hearing. That's number one. Number two is that uh, Senator Mike Gravel and uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Kirkpatrick is working on a situation where there'll be a bill that will go before the United Nations General Assembly and we're trying to get a hearing before the United Nations General Assembly. So these are two, two of the three projects that I'm involved in now. Uh, so it's uh, public education, education of the entire planet the B, we have been and are being visited and interfered with uh, by non-terrestrial beings, whether they be from another dimension or another planet or somewhere else or within the earth or already living here. Entities that are, have been kept in secret from the general public of the planet. We want that knowledge out. So that's one of my primary goals since we did uh, the last alien human contact. That's what the goal of Third Phase of Moon is to get the word out. The mainstream media is not doing their job and that's exactly why we're interviewing here you again because you have, like we said, the smoking gun. We really hope people pay attention to it. Now, one of the Roper polls said one in 40 people have been abducted, which is a staggering, staggering number. The people that have had them removed, have any of them had a, a repeat abduction where another insertion was made? Uh, in short, has anyone had uh, any uh, new installations of uh, implants? And as far as I know, no. Now you got to remember that it's not every single abductee that gets implanted. Uh, we figure, you know, that there's something close to human logic that they may be using. So well, what we do is about 15% of the species we were, that we are studying will get implanted so we can remotely get the information we need. Not to say that myself or anyone else should have the ego to try and look at the logic of a civilization which may be 
80 to 100 million years older than we are. How could we possibly conceive their thought processes or compare their thought process to us? But if we base this only on human logic, you don't have to implant every single abductee subject. And since they're working with humans, you know, again, maybe they have to lower themselves to human uh, resources and human technology uh, in order to get the information that they need. So that's possible too. It may be just as hard for an 80 million or a year old civilization to communicate with us thought-wise than it is for us to conceive of them being able to do what they do. Do you think by you removing those 17 implants may have possibly disrupted them to want to put them in more secretive areas? Uh, the answer to that is no, because um, it seems to me that if they wouldn't uh, allow me to take these out, uh, in a literature search I did before I ever started doing this, uh, nobody was ever successful in removing a suspected alien implant. They would turn to powder or disappear or whatever. So uh, maybe there is a group that says, yes, you go ahead, take them out because in certain individuals we don't need them anymore. And go ahead, analyze them, you know, and then reach out you know, to the public and give this to the public as public knowledge because one of these days there's going to be openness between us and the human race on planet Earth. So, but, you know, not to say that there is another group that might be involved that said, oh, we're going to make sure that they can't take this out. But interesting, there has been evidence that people have had implants come out of an eye uh, also, one of the most famous implants of all has been implants that have been in the nose, associated with nosebleeds and, and the whole uh, gamut of things that go along with it. I don't have one of those. I've never seen one, but I've heard story after story after story. And I guess if I keep doing this, maybe someone will come along and sneeze and they'll actually sneeze into a cloth or Kleenex or whatever, and there one will be, and we can look at it. Now that we're talking about uh, medical procedures in essence, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned in the last film, that there's no inflammatory response upon removal or insertion of these objects. What Can you reiterate to the world how important this is to the medical community if they would just take a look? at your research? Well, if we could get uh, academic research medicine to look at the materials, it is very possible that we could duplicate what is the cause of this non-rejection, non-inflammatory reaction and, and duplicate it and, and use it in, for example, uh, wrapping a pin, a screw, a liver, a heart, or any transplanted organ into the body. And being that it's your own DNA, you wouldn't reject it. You wouldn't have to be taking uh, anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life uh, at a tremendous loss. I want to be very honest. It would be a tremendous economic loss to the pharmaceutical industry. So do, do they really want that to happen? I mean, the public certainly would love it to happen. Now, I was just uh, perusing an article on uh, modern uh, 3D printers, and they expect within five years, five short years, that they will, able to, well, they will be able to reproduce a cardiac cell and have it duplicate in a 3D printer a human heart with its the same DNA. A person will not be uh, waiting for a donor. They'll just duplicate this in a 3D biological printer and they'll install it into the body. And you won't need any of that medication, that anti-rejection medication. It's ironic you mentioned 3D printing. As a matter of fact, on the news the other night, they showed a demonstration of a 3D printer making a pizza. <laughs> yeah. Now let's get to a final message you have to the world. 
anything you want to tell them. And viewers, skeptics, believers alike, everybody, what would you have to say? What I would say would be to repeat <coughs> what uh, Senator Gravel said to us at the closing of the citizens' hearing, and that if you really want an impact on the world this, for this subject, don't leave it up to governments to do it. Do it yourself. Each individual. It's their responsible responsibility to get this information out to the rest of the world. Then governments have to respond. So I, I always say, you know, if you find a researcher that you deem as credible and they have a DVD or they have a book or they have something else that you can pass out, buy one or two of them and give them away as presents. Give a, give a DVD as a birthday present or as a Christmas present or as a wedding present or anniversary, whatever. Give something of knowledge away to that person who may look at it, read it, see it, and that person could get excited and give one away to somebody else. So we could pass that on through the whole world and continue to use the advancing world of communication, where we have an increase in devices almost every week because of the competitiveness of the, of the way that the electronics industry is being conducted. There's always, you know, another iPhone, another this, another that, another gadget you can hold in your hand with more and more and more information on it. Where's the app on ETs? Somebody's going to do it. I completely agree. You heard it all from the man himself. Thank you very much, Dr. Roger Lear. My pleasure. We at Third Phase of Moon want to thank Dr. Roger Lear for this exclusive interview, along with special team member Dr. Danny Elias for corresponding it. And if you captured something incredible in regards to UFOs, contact us via Skype or Facebook, Third Phase of Moon. Keep your eyes on the skies, everybody, and we'll see you again next time. Third.